Now, on the night of the 14th and 15th of April 2014, Boko Haram changed the course of history with the abduction of 276 students in Chibok, Borno State. And 10 years after the abduction from the government girls' secondary school, Chibok, a report reveals that 21 of the released girls came back with 34 children. And according to the report released by the Motala Mohammed Foundation to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the abduction, the report served as a devastating confirmation of the sexual violence and forced marriages the girls were subjected to in captivity. The report also shows that 48 parents of the abducted victims died due to trauma. And let's bring you a report by our correspondent, Theophilos Ilama. In the wee hours of the 14th of April 2014, Boko Haram seized over 250 schoolgirls from their dormitories in Government Girls Secondary School, Chibok, local government area of Borno State. While 128 regained freedom in batches over nine years, the whereabouts of 91 others remain unknown. The abduction sparked global outrage and took the headlines. It also birthed an international movement, Bring Back Our Girls. Now, 10 years later, 91 girls are yet to regain freedom as civil society organizations are raising their voices to remind the government of its promise. Over the last 10 years, about 1.5 billion naira has been allocated to the Chibok girls. We've asked the Federal Ministry of Women Affairs twice with a freedom of information request, and they've not responded either time. So the point is, if you're really engaged and concerned about the girls, if anybody is asking about the welfare of the girls, you should be willing um, to provide information. It's not easy to stay with, without my daughter for two, three years. Remember, for the eight of us are late. And most of them that are late, due to trauma, heartbreaking, high blood pressure, you know, not all of us can eat all. Mothers, fathers, and friends of the Chiba community all gathered here to make a case for the release of the girls. One of the Chiba girls who was held in captivity while narrating our ordeal sent a message of hope to others still held. Okay, my message to them, to those that are still in captivity is now, they should just be strong. I know they are not finding it easy. Life is so hard for them. They are going through a lot. But they should just hold on. Nigeria needs a missing persons register. We've only been able to advocate for the Chiba girls, talk about 91, 112, because we had their names. At least 38 school abductions have happened. There's no documentation of that anywhere. Even this one, the government has never produced a list. Like many others who have escaped harrowing conditions in Boko Haram hideouts, these girls turned women now face a different type of challenge, the struggle to restart their lives when so much has changed. It is hoped that governments will re-strategize and see the rescue of those still in the terrorist den. Theophilus Elama, TVC News, Lagos. I remember when this story first broke and it received global attention with the hashtag bring back our girls and now we understand 21 of the ladies are, that were freed returned with 34 children and also the report stating that these girls were either forced into marriage and of course experienced some level of sexual violence. What are your thoughts on this? Um, Shekau threatened at that time that I will marry them to his fighters. You know, usually when he issues threats, by his nature, he, you must take the threat seriously because he will do what he said he will do. That was what I said some time ago, that some people, you know, uh, uh, misjudged the point that I was making. You know, say me illiterate on social media, they say, ah, so did they trust Shekau so much that he was saying that uh, Shekau doesn't lie? You know, including one of the spokespersons, of the government at that time, you know. Shekau make, he made that he want. He said, Are we either sell some of them into slavery or marry, marry them, them to my fighters? He did that. He married them to his fighters. A good number of those girls got married to the fighters, commanders, and the rest of them. The commanders who first pick 
before ordinary Boko Haram fighters would gain access to the guests. This was what was happening. Dogo Gide, who, the, a bandit who has ties to Boko Haram, he did the same thing with the students of Federal Government College. Baptist? No, in um, uh, Kebi. Okay. That FGC that they, mm. they stormed. Some of them too came back with kids after almost two years in captivity. You know? And some he married to his fighters. So some of these people, they behave like, oh, uh, when we go to war, women are, are part of the spoils of war. I said, how did that? So these girls had, uh, were married to those fighters. Even some of the fighters, I remember a case of one of those fighters aligning with his wife, a Chibo girl, to escape from um, uh, the camp. The big problem that they even face, those of them who are out of uh, uh, Boko Haram's uh, camp, mm. and um, along with their husbands, is the society continues to stigmatize them. They call them, they, they call their children Boko Haram children and all that. One of the girls was saying, after uh, I've had three kids for my husband, a Boko Haram fighter, people are saying we should remarry. How can I remarry? Some of them have converted to Islam. And Tibok is a predominantly Christian community. Yeah. So their parents can't live with the fact that they've uh, joined a different faith. They now tell them, I'll come back to uh, Christianity. And they are saying, no. A lot of indoctrination has taken place. See, those girls, the ones that, uh, out of the 91, some are dead. The first set of Chibo girls that were released in May 2017 actually confessed that some of their colleagues were beaten by snakes and they died yeah. in captivity. Some died of natural causes. You know, you fall sick, you have malaria, no proper treatment in such a place. Mm -hmm. Some have died. Then there are those that have refused bluntly to return home. To return home. Because they've been thoroughly brainwashed, thoroughly indoctrinated, and married to commanders who are taking good care of them. Because when, this, when they go to attack communities, the commanders, because of the position they occupy, are able, they are much more comfortable than the ordinary fighters. And they take good care of their women. Mm. So those ones, they don't see any need to come back. Okay. There was a case of uh, one of the guests who, uh, who was rescued. I'm not saying uh, Chibogi, one of mm. the guests, uh, uh, but no guests rescued. She went back to the forest. Mm -hmm. During that time, she was constantly communicating with the husband, who is a, a fighter. And in the end, she went back because they, they, no, they do not even receive them properly. That's the society. Yes, the mental agony that you give them by not integrating them, them properly into, into the community is one reason a lot of these guys don't Return. want to come back. Right. That same problem is, people talk about Leah Sharibu. Ah, Leah Sharibu. Leah Sharibu is not likely to want to come home. Leah Sharibu has been married twice. Yeah. Inside Boko Haram uh, um, uh, camp. Married twice. The first husband died. She remarried another person. Leah Sharibu has been trained now as a midwife slash nurse. And she has no plan to come back. But because people don't know what is going on there, they'll think, ah, she's probably suffering. She doesn't want to, I mean, she would like to come. A lot of them don't want to come back. I saw a video that Shekau released before he died. Because I used to really monitor his videos and try to analyze them. Where those guests were, she bought guests carrying guns, AK-47, and saying that they have no reason, they have no plan to come back. So this is much more deeper than we ever even anticipated. Of course, yeah, of course. Very, very because when people talk, they think that, oh, those guests don't want to come back. Oh, those guests are still there. Many of them are dead. You know, it's a complicated matter. We will have secured the release of a good number of these guests early. But the factionalization of Boko Haram in August 2016, complicated matters. The first time the Nigerian 
um, uh, government tried to secure the release of these girls, they had made up, they had uh, agreed a location somewhere not far away from Dikwa was identified, an open feed. The moment they were trying to do the exchange, fighters from the rival camp um. came and said, if you release any of these guests, we will go and kill all the Chibok guests in our, in our own camp. Because once the, 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 the uh, group broke into factions, the Alba and Awi slash Mama Noor faction, mm. Mama Noor was a politician, a father figure. Albanawi was, is dead now, was one of the sons of the man who started the Boko Haram movement. Mm. So ISIS then chose him. You know, Shekau got affiliated with ISIS. Yeah. But ISIS got tired of what Shekau was doing, killing people who had the slightest uh, provocation. Uh, provocation. Somebody, uh, one of his fighters, bought a, a motorcycle in Photocol. Photocol is a border town with Cameroon. It's in Cameroon, along the border with Nigeria. The guy got back to camp. He killed him just because he bought the motorcycle. So they were tired of those reports that he was killing fellow Muslims. So they now appointed Al Abu Musab al Banawi as the leader of the group in August 2016. Once they made that uh, appointment. Shekau said, look, I'm not going to pay homage to him. I will do my own. Let okay. him do his own. Okay. The attempt to secure the release of the first set was aborted. Because they said, look, we are not in the picture. If you take these guests away, all the Chibok guests in our own camp will go and waste them. The government had to make another move. Then in 2017, we secured the release. release of the first set. After the second one, I think President Buhari got tired of the fact that, look, this thing is complicated and it's not free. Yes, we'll get the Swiss government, um, um, Red Cross sometimes, to mediate. to mediate. But you and I know that those guys will not simply release guests to you for free. Yeah. For free. <laughs> Unfortunately, since Chibok happened, Mm. Bandits, terrorists, they've now seen that it makes sense to them to kidnap uh, school children yeah. because they will grab headlines as a result. Yeah. If, they, if they kidnap ordinary people, they won't get that kind of headline. So we have to do our best to stop this thing from consistently happening. Right. Find a way to stop it as a tribute to those guys. Yeah, and, in and then if... The Bono still have touch a book. Mm -hmm. No more kidnapping happened in Bono because the government used his head. The people in government used their heads. They moved students away from dangerous areas. Everybody come to the state capital. That is what some governors are not doing now. Areas that are not safe, you are still keeping students there, endangering their lives. Mm. For me, if a place is identified as unsafe, don't allow any form of educational to continue. Um, uh, uh, to move them to the state capital. MJ, your thoughts on this matter? Because we understand that you know there are so many eyes, so many angles to this. But from your own perspective, kidnappings right now still persist, even in the north. What do you think the government needs to do to address this underlying issues that you know give issues like this? We have the underlying issues. We understand are widespread poverty, lack of unemployment, economic opportunities, and so many other factors like this. How do you think the government can address these issues so that we do not have repeat, a repeat of what we've, we're talking about at this moment? Yeah, um, I know we've, we've highlighted some of these uh, things on the uh, program uh, before now. And uh, you see, the moments you allow uh, a kidnap to happen mm. and it gets prolonged, then it becomes complicated. So look at the last one that happened. <clears throat> In Kaduna, how it was dealt with decisively. I think in about a week or two, uh, the, the girls were back before they were fully integrated into the system. And we need to take more decisive actions to deal with 
those who are responsible for this crime, those uh, the terrorists and the, and, and the kidnappers. We need to deal, I mean, take a very decisive action, I mean, very punitive measures. And punitive in, in what sense now? As in, offer? Uh, you know, before now, they will say some um, uh, kidnappers, some bandits have repented, will integrate back, them back to the system. There's nothing like that. They, we can never have a repentant kidnapper or terrorist. They should be given the capital punishment. It is, I mean, they should know that. See, when you know, for, for a kidnapper or a terrorist, who knows that, well, if I pretend to have uh, repented, I will get, um, I'll be integrated back into the system. So, the, that was the impetus for others to stop uh, that kind of uh, activity. Practice, yeah. So that's why, because they have not been treated with, I mean, with we a hard line. We have them with kid gloves. We have them with kid gloves. That's why we are getting this kind of uh, stuff. And like I said, if we have a situation where these things prolong, you can imagine, I mean, uh, 276 students kidnapped, uh, 185 in total came back, 91 still unaccounted for unaccounted for mm. like Billy said we are not sure if the whole 91 are still alive mm. so well 10 years after the moment it prolongs beyond three four months then you can't get back you can't get them back in whole mm. you know and these are uh, teenagers in their formative age it's easy to convince them to change their minds so that's why they get them they, them easily married uh, out to those um, to the commanders and mm. all those. So, we government needs to take decisive actions, as in stop uh, reintegrating them back to the system. We are terror. We are terrorist. Then we are treated as a terrorist. I mean, as an enemy of the state, mm. and that is the way they should be treated. Of somebody who go into schools and kidnap scores, tens of um, uh, students, they should be. Treated as terrorists. You know, Biko, I and remember. Even the capital punishment. Absolutely. I remember when you were talking about um, this issue in the North that it behoves on the government to take this matter decisively and not wait for the central government to come to their rescue. You are talking about they know these bandits, they know these terrorists, so they know how best to, you know, deal with the situation. We know their locations, you know. I, I still have a sense of regret that we didn't get hold of Shekau. Not because we didn't have intelligence about his exact location. No. If anyone tells me, oh, we did, the army didn't have uh, exact location, I, I would not agree. I would not agree. Mm. When Albanawi moved, because ISIS gave him a mandate to unite after, you know, he was, he was picked up. He was in detention within the group. Their own faction occupies the Lake Chad Islands. They are in the Lake Chad Islands, mm -hmm. where whereas Shekau stayed in um, Sambisa and um, um, the Mandara Mountains, you know, the Mandara Mountains around Adama, Shekau's men are still there till tomorrow. Mm. And then Sambisa being an area that extends to at least seven states. Right. It's difficult to police Sambisa. Sambisa is so huge. People do hold it and they are constantly moving. But when Abanawi was brought out of detention or prison, within the camp, and ISIS named them the Amir. What does that mean? Amir means like Emir, like the head okay. of the group. They then gave him a mandate that, look, we are embarrassed that there are two factions. Go and unite these factions. Take every step to bring everybody together. He then moved to go and kill Shekau. Mm. So he got to Shekau's hideout. He had him surrounded. Shekau saw that the end had come. He used his uh, suicide vest to take his own life. Oh, really? Yes, that was what happened. He took his own life 
Albanawi actually in a in a, a video describes a cow as somebody not fit to be described as a Muslim, arguing that a Muslim shouldn't take his own life. You understand? Mm. So, but Albanawi was injured in that operation, and he eventually succumbed to his injuries. Mm. But the fighting between both groups as a result of uh, the killing of Shekau has not stopped. They've killed hundreds of each other's uh, members. They are now bitter enemies. This one, and you know one of the reasons it was difficult for them to agree to unite was because if you are a commander under Shekau, one, the Albanawi faction will not trust you so much. They want to turn you to an ordinary fighter. You that you are already a commander yeah. in hierarchy. Then some of the benefits that you get as a commander, you will not get it under Abu Musab al-Banawi. Mm. So they were reluctant to allow that merger to happen. So instead of allowing the merger to happen, they were fighting one another. They will go kill this one today. Tomorrow go to another camp kill the other people. They've been doing that even till uh, very recently they were still, as, as recent as last month, they are still killing. So why is it so difficult to get these individuals? That put you know, well, now what I'm saying, if Abu Musab al banawi could go to where Shekau was, he knew where he was, and led his men to go with a mission to kill him, that means that we have no excuse to not know because mm -hmm. the location is far apart. Right. The, that, the other that, one, that, the Abu Musab, that, that the movement. Yeah. They are in, and the, the movement is, is, is not the place, it's not close. You are in um, Lake Chad Islands, the Tumbus mm. of Lake Chad, and somebody is inside Sambisa. But they were still able to get pinpointed this location and came for him. So I'm saying that we need to do a lot more. I'm not saying that we've not done well. People must understand me. Right. Yeah. I'm a friend of the armed forces, but the truth also has to be it's said so, that we need to do a lot more. Yeah. Because the more these guys succeed at what they are doing, the more they become emboldened. Yeah. Yes, actually in the Northeast, we've done a tremendous job. To kind of have served a lot of justice to these people. Mm -hmm. They are not as strong as they used to be, let's face it. Mm -hmm. But banditry has now assumed a larger than life yeah, image. Yeah. Look at the number of abductions that we experienced in the month of March alone. And to the extent that on Salad Day... 155 abductions. Yeah. Mm. In one month. Mm. It's scary. That's close to a thousand. It's scary. Oh, yeah. Oh. And a lot of it not documented. Though. Right. Some will just mm. simply go and um, uh, settle. Negotiate, and, and, yeah. And come back. So we need to be more, much more decisive, sp not spare these people, not entertain any... Uh, 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 peace over tears because when they are facing the heat, that is when they make move. They say, Look, I want to make peace. Mm. Immediately, you make peace with them, they come back and start killing people. Mm -hmm. So, what I'm saying, if the bandit who has killed more soldiers than any bandit that I know is Sunny Dangote that was killed by um, Dan Kremi recently, I I knew his camp. I went to Shinfida where he had his camp. I interviewed bandits there. So I'm worried that we didn't go to level his camp. I've said it. Why? Why would we not level his camp? Mm. Why? Go back to the documentary that I made. Mm. I stood on the road leading to his camp, less than 300 meters to his camp. And we didn't level the camp. Why? That's what we need to do. Identify their camps, take these guys out. Right. If they suffer a lot of setbacks, they, they, they many of them will, will, they will be able to regroup. Yeah. Yes, many of them will, will give up. MJ, final thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, think, I think I will ally with uh, Gideon. Like I said earlier, we don't need to continue to treat them with uh, kid gloves. They mm -hmm. should be treated as terrorists and deal with them ruthlessly and decisive, de decisively. decisively. Yeah, by ensuring that we, we hit them so hard that they are on, they, they won't be able to recover. They will mm. find it difficult to recover. So they, they, will, they will surrender. And when they eventually surrender, they, will, they, will, they should be tried and put in jail. 
not for them to be uh, reabsorbed into uh, to the system. I will not be paying them. They will always go back. They will go back. <laughs> they are different Look from... at that one now. That, that one who took a uh, yeah. Quran and swore that uh, he will not do he went, it again. He went back. When he uh, got uh, fed up of uh, the, the crumbs, he just went back. Only to be killed by fellow bandits. Yeah. But then was saying, why? You've uh, abandoned us. Why, right. why are you coming back? To that guy took out Daudawa. Daudawa was one of the two bandits that worked with Shekau to kidnap the government secondary school Kankara boys in Kasina. Mm. You know? Indeed, government needs to be decisive in dealing with these insecurity issues, not yeah. just for now, but for posterity. Well, that's where we have to wrap today's episode of Journalist Hangout. Join us again tomorrow for another episode of the program. You can also watch a repeat broadcast of it tonight at 11, also on Sunday from 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. We are also on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash TVC News Nigeria. I'd also like to thank members of the panel here in the studio as usual, Babajide Kolade, Otito Drew, and Mojid Jamu. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for your thank thoughts you very much. on the program. But that's it on it tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Esther Mokwarela. Bye for now, and God bless Nigeria.